Antietam, a textbook example of why in war you sometimes have to take risks. In real life, the Union technically won the battle, as the CSA forces retreated from Maryland. But in reality, the Union should have won the war almost entirely right here, had they pressed any one of several advantages. Oh, and something about Burnside's bridge. Wow, this took a while to rearrange. After second bull run, I had just been putting the damaged units off into third and fourth corps to deal with later. And now that later has arrived, I got to micro-adjust all of them. Good thing I'm just the type of person who likes to do that. Uh, occasionally, anyway. So what's changed? I've put the career point into economy, and brought every colonel and general from the barracks for starters. In the reputation menu, I, as always, passed on the money and manpower due to their expense, and buying generals at this point is somewhat unnecessary. As for the weapons, I pass on the cannons. The James is good at medium range, and the Whitworth is the game's longest cannon period with decent effect all the way out, but sadly, both of these weapons are only available right now for reputation and only in these quantities. They will never appear in the reputation menu again, nor will I get any chance to buy them normally. And they aren't common weapons for the Union either, so getting them from fallen opponents is a rarity as well. The rifles are a bit different. I will pass on the Enfields, but only because I have well over 10,000 of them now, and am still getting some from Union formations. I had enough to equip all my mid-range teams with some left to spare, so no need to drop points here. The CS Richmonds are a good replacement for the Lorenz rifles on my sniper specialists. 1,500 of them is just enough to equip one of my 1,500-man teams as well, so I will grab them but I won't put them into the roster yet, simply due to a lack of replacement. Aside from the 1500 here, I bought out all of the ones in the armory, which was 25. Not 2500, just 25. For the moment, I'd like to keep my sniper specialists with similar stats, so I'm packing them all with the Lorenzes for now, buying extras at the armory to supply my newly two-starred sniper teams. As for other purchases, I bought out all of the available palmettos from the Infantry tab, the scoped Whitworths from the Skirmisher tab, as well as the 10-pound Ordnance, 10-pound Parrots, Tregegar, 24-pounders, and 20-pound Parrots from the Cannon tab. Some of these are just for replacement purposes due to a low reserve, but the 10-pound Ordnance and 24-pounders are going to get to see the field today. These are not all the weapons I bought prior to Antietam, but they are the ones I bought specifically. I ended up also getting a ton more smooth bores, just as a side effect of building up with my cores. A quick look at the upcoming fight shows what we are set to deploy. I am required to bring three cores, with two more optional, and each of the three cores are limited to 20 brigades. So let's see what they look like. As per my core design philosophy video, all three cores are designed in roughly the same way, and for a fight like this, I have homogenized the core commanding generals as well using a four pack of guys with both the increased speed and infantry specialist perks including the Mouse Master himself back in charge of 1st Corps. Let's look at 1st Corps in more detail. I'm finally in a position to arrange the brigades by the numeric names I've chosen for them, and I hope they make more sense now than when I was readjusting them all over the place in the side missions. Three sniper infantry and two close-range batteries in the 1st Division, three mid-range infantry and two long-range batteries in 2nd Division, the Snipesimers and three mid-range batteries in 3rd Division, and a large team of Scrubs in 4th. Normally, the first Scrub team would be a melee specialist armed with Palmettos, but I haven't taken that step yet. As these guys are going to be the point unit of the map, I'm giving the best cannons to them. Sylvestrin and a 10-pound Parrot as long range, the mid-range teams are all packing the 10-pound ordnance, and the two close supports are going to be the debut of the 24-pounder howitzer. Lastly, everyone but the scrub teams are being led by, at minimum, a Brigadier General. Of big note is that 1-2-1 midrange, when led by 3-star General Daniel Hill, has become my first infantry unit with 3 stars of experience. 
The two tier 3 infantry perks are both decent, and neither are buggy, so what you see is what you get. But as for which I tend to pick, it's usually the sharpshooter skill. The spotting is good for mid-range teams that hold the line, as well as for infantry snipers who tend to try and get around the flanks. Advanced intel cannot be overrated. The only unit I really consider the elite training on is the melee specialist team, which I don't have yet. Though 145 Scrub is doing its best to try to become one, and I've annotated them with MIT, which stands for Melee and Training. Second and third cores are both designed the same way, though without the top tier gear being given to them. Whereas in first core, I increased manpower almost exclusively with veterans, other than the scrub teams, of course. For second and third cores, I used both veteran and rookie troops to supplement their numbers for cost reasons. I know it looks like I have a lot of money left over, but as a reminder, I had over 600,000 to start with. Also, I don't have enough two-star trained brigades to make sniper and mid-range squads across all three cores. I gave preferential treatment to first core, which I filled up, then to second, where I just added extra rookie brigades where a trained brigade would otherwise go. Third core has no highly trained infantry, but they will also be the last onto the stage, and if they do need help, fourth core's ragtag bunch of misfits will be present at the end. And speaking of fourth core, I've retired that three star cavalry unit. It was down to 128 men with bad guns and bad perks. It just wasn't worth paying to replace them, but I also didn't want to send them out in a suicidal blaze of officer losing glory either. As for the other three cavalry teams, they all get to choose their first perk. And while these look like three nice, diverse perks, there is a problem. Two of them are bugged, and the horseback riding perk is bugged in the worst way. The movement speed bonus doesn't work, and the efficiency bonus for both that and the endurance course perk don't work either, which makes the riding perk categorically worse than the endurance course. So the choice comes down to whether you want to use cavalry as a mobile shock unit or a mobile skirmish team. If shock, take discipline. If skirmish, take endurance. While I do keep some of my cavalry armed with weapons that are technically skirmish guns, they won't actually be used as a mobile skirmish team, so for all of my horse dudes, it will be the discipline training. Both stamina and morale can be easily earned by just running around in a battle, but the efficiency bonus is my preference, and it only works on one perk. And rounding out the fourth core, for now at least, is six squads of 1,000 man infantry, led by whatever officers I could get my hands on. In this case, majors. This actually not only uses up all of the farmers, reboard farmers, and Springfield 1842s I had on hand, but also just about depletes the armory of them as well. So, yeah, this is what my mistake back in second bull run cost me. I sure could use another 4,000 muskets right now, but I'll make do. We have entered the state of Maryland to bring the war into Union territory. General McClellan moved to intercept us with a much bigger army. We are outnumbered, but we shall prepare to meet our enemy near the town of Sharpsburg, creating a solid defense behind Antietam Creek. We need to deploy at least three corps to cover the area, to protect our left, center, and right. The rest of our army is marching from Harper's Ferry and will soon join us. We must not lose this battle, or General McClellan will be able to encircle and destroy our army. Good luck. You know, for facing off against a much bigger army, these numbers don't seem to line up. Someone should tell our PR guy that he is allowed to not embellish every fight to make it sound like the Alamo. Also, this is Sharpsburg? I could have sworn the name of this town was First Winchester. This is the town of Sharpsburg. The nearby area offers good defensive positions that will help counter the Union Army of General McClellan. Antietam Creek on the east helps us to defend our right flank. This bridge should be defended because the Federals will surely attempt to cross it.
The river has several other possible passages, but we do not have enough men to guard them all. Well, that's up for debate. We expect the main bulk of the Union Army to arrive from the valley situated at the north of the town. We must guard our left flank at Nicodemus Hill. We should also place most of our infantry in these woods that provide good protection from enemy fire. Our line will extend eastwards up to this location along the sunken road. From here we can dominate the river crossing to the east. The rest of our troops are on their way and will arrive down this road. The Union Army is in position and may attack at dawn. Be wary, General. Union forces are approaching from the north. We need to hold our defensive lines established in the woods. Nicodemus Hill is perfect for placing our artillery and shooting at the flanks of the advancing Union lines. Our main objective is to not allow the enemy to capture the Dunker Church area, which will allow their further advance towards the town and our supply center. Furthermore, the church provides excellent sight lines that will help us track the Union's movements. We expect our first reinforcements to arrive in about two hours, so it is advised to not overstretch our lines with aggressive maneuvers. Watch your flanks and hold tight. Good luck, General. Welcome to Antietam. This map is large, but not the biggest so far. It's also long, but not the longest so far. It also has numerous opportunities for maneuver, use of cover, and other ways to gain advantages to maximize a result. But no matter how good you are, you have to be prepared for one simple truth. You are going to lose a lot of men. Union equipment is improved significantly over the last grand battle, and their army is about 80,000 in size. And this is just medium difficulty. So the overall goal of this stage isn't to just disproportionately affect the Union, but also to try and make sure it's the least valuable of your troops that takes the greatest amount of damage, which is easier said than done. But enough rambling, let's get to it. The phase one map is simple in that the enemy all come from the top. Their force will be several skirmishers, including three that are quite far forward, and a number of infantry and cannons. The cannons will all start no farther left than here, and the infantry will be divided up all over the place. But there will be two here and one here that are the big linchpin of how this phase will play out. I want to make this clear. This video is not an instruction manual. In any given attempt at this stage, the enemy infantry may go just about anywhere and for just about any reason. The plan I lay out will try to guide them to a specific result while also having a contingency in place. But depending on how picky you are with respect to your post-battle casualty screen, you might be playing this stage a few times. The goal is to have all the Union funneled to this area, which will be heavily defended, and from cover. So let's slide the screen down a bit to explain how to try and attempt that. The AI in this game has three major goals. One is to chase your troops, one is to secure objectives, and the third is defined by the developers on a stage-by-stage -stage basis. Which objective they prioritize can often change due to battlefield conditions and some random factors. So while this method will entice the Union's west flank to move east, there's no guarantee. So, here's our troop disposition. In the top left deploy box, I'll drop one sniper team, one mid-range team, and the snipe simmers, as well as a supply wagon. The sniper infantry will hide in the trees here and hopefully remain unspotted for a while. The mid-range team will sit back in this spot 
and also hope to be unspotted due to how far back they are. Hexamer will take up a position here, where he will be providing west side spotting, as well as being heavily influential in taking flanking shots, while hidden, against enemy troops in the large areas of open field whenever possible. The center deploy box will have the Sylvestrin, a close range battery, a sniper infantry team, and two scrubs, one of which will be the melee and training brigade. They'll move to these positions. Once in place, give everyone but the cannons hold ground orders to prevent unwanted rotations. The bottom box will be the other close support cannon, a scrub, and a mid-range, who will deploy out to here at a full sprint. Once in place, be sure to hand out hold ground orders to the infantry to, again, prevent them from turning unwantedly. The idea is that these skirmishers will be the first to spot your forces, and what they see will determine some of the Union behavior. I want them to see a unit that heads for the defensive line first. That is the job of this scrub infantry. He will start the stage at a sprint, head up to around here to try to get their attention, and then fall back to this position, half in the trees, half in the house, and told to hold ground when he arrives. If at all possible, try and have him stay spotted while this is happening. The longer he is the only CSA force spotted, the more likely the left side Union troops will go for him instead of heading directly south. The long-term goal is that, once the enemy are all committed to this location, the snipesmers and sniper infantry on the left can begin to swing around the left side to get into the enemy backfield and either mess up their cannons or take free shots at retreating units. As they do this, the mid-range team can then move over to this area and wait for a good opportunity to swing up to the enemy's side and plaster them. There is a gap between sets of trees right here. This is your focal point for the left edge of this combat. If the enemy is in that gap, then swinging around the mid-range to hit them in the side is perfect, as they will either have to turn to face the mid-range or the householding scrub group, and the other team will then get a side shot at the unit in the open as a result. If the enemy is north of that gap in the trees here, then leave your mid-range back at the house and wait for them to move south first. Life is rarely so ideal, however, and some of the enemy infantry will sometimes come this way. How to react comes down to how many infantry approach. If it is a single brigade, then the forest-covered sniper team and snipesimers should be able to route them in short order. If a second team approaches, then dispatch the mid-range squad to support them from here until they are beat up enough to not pose a threat to the various snipers, then head back. If three infantry approach, then you are going to want to sprint the mid-range team into the woods to take up the point position, and rotate the sniper infantry and hexamer farther to the side to get flanking shots into the open field opponents. A well-trained mid-range team should be able to hold long enough for the three of them to route the three Union groups. If four or more brigades show up, then God help you. In all my attempts while devising this strategy, as long as I get this team spotted first, I've never had more than three infantry head this way, so take that as you will. But all that is really the sideshow. The bulk of the Union Army will come down this way and primarily engage one of these two brigades, often by taking two volleys, then charging them. Both brigades have backup built into the design, though. First off, be sure your general is positioned here, in such a spot that his influence ring covers both units. Then it depends on which brigade gets hit. If it's this one, then the holding ground sniper, MIT scrub, and these two cannons should all provide counter-charge fire to chase them off. And if desired, you can swing the mid-range team here to take a supporting volley as well. Just keep them far enough south that they don't themselves get shot in the side. If this is the brigade that gets rushed, then the MIT scrubs, this battery, and the nearby mid-range team can all provide support fire. Note that the close-range batteries are the brand new 24-pound howitzers, or as I sometimes call them, the atomic shotgun. They are the game's most powerful cannons at short range, and if you are close enough to fire explosive, or god willing canister rounds, you can take an enemy formation from fresh to fleeing in one volley. If firing into a melee scrum, your own troops will get a fair amount of splash damage in the process, 
but in most cases, the exchange is well worth it. Since, you know, most of the time, you're actually firing into a melee of, like, one of your units and four of theirs, not the other way around. Even if you succeed in chasing off whoever melee rushed you, there's a good chance the unit that engaged them will be in bad morale. This is what the MIT scrubs are here for. As soon as either of these units loses enough morale to start panicking, then have the MIT team fill in for them, and as soon as the unit finishes panicking, have them take the MIT scrub's place. Trust me, there's more melee coming, so it's not like the melee and training scrub team somehow missed their chance to practice. They just didn't have to take the first wave of it. Your own reinforcements will arrive at 6.30. When they do, and if you're using a setup like mine, take one scrub team and the other highly trained squads and send them north to where your various snipers are making the enemy's support line an absolute mess. Send the rest of your incoming scrubs, as well as all of your cannons, to the east edge. Phase 2 will be starting not long after everyone gets here, and we need those bodies in the area that it's about to be expanded into. Was that a steam notification? Hold on. Can't talk. Busy routing union dogs. Where was I? Alright, a couple notes. While there aren't really any Phase 1 reinforcements for the Union, they will be getting a ton in Phase 2, all approaching from the Northeast. It's tempting to try and surround the enemy force before Phase 1 runs out, but that is an excellent way to get your own highly trained First Corps flanked into oblivion. Instead, try and make sure that, by the end of the battle timer, your own line isn't pressing the opponents any further than here. The speedy snipesimers can dart in and out to try to get some cheeky shots, but your infantry needs to have sufficient time to set up to receive Phase 2's big force. And the part of the battlefield that was just used to engage the first force is just as good at engaging the second. Also, Nicodemus Hill's objective is not part of the final stage objectives. However, if it is ever fully captured by the Union, Phase 1 ends immediately. This is bad enough as is, but if it happens before your reinforcements arrive at 6.30, then not only will they not arrive now, they will be out of the rest of the entire stage. That's why holding this area is important. The stage intro said it's for placing cannons to shoot at the Union troops, but its in-game representation is a required rearbound region for receiving readied reinforcements. Until your backup arrives, don't let the Union get to here. And lastly, there are several defensive spots you can garrison your troops in, and their bonus is slightly better than the wheat field provides. However, the main attacks from the Union will tend to hit the units in the woods, not the fence line, and as usual, garrisoning troops causes their damage output to drop slightly. So if the guys in the wheat field ever get charged, then by all means, occupy the fence to get the defense and melee bonus. Otherwise, I find it best to sit right behind it instead. And all that said, let's get started. I leave the supply wagon on the vision point for a bit just to see if I'm getting mass rushed, but it should have already been up behind the sniper infantry. Hexamer is providing enough spotting.
Well, this isn't exactly what I was planning for. Two infantry making a beeline for the Sylvestrian battery. Well, time to slide a couple units to deal with it. This isn't a total disaster. I'll admit I got a bit lucky here. The enemy skirmish teams ended up blocking the line of fire of the infantry behind them, giving me a bit of extra time to fight off the enemy charge. But that little extra time has run out, and since my general was just slightly too far right, the infantry panicked and ran. Melee and training team, your turn. And this little wooded house is turning into a bloodbath. Still, while the MIT suffered a morale break of their own, they have fought off both unit infantry chargers, my midrange is now in position on the side, and my own reinforcements are starting to arrive. Also, with the successful swing of the eastern midrange team causing most of the Union infantry to be panicking and or at half strength, I decide to try and press an advantage by getting them into the northeast woods to find those cannons that have been bombing me for the last hour.
I know I said to move half the force to the far east side, but as long as they are in position when the battle timer ends, they'll be fine. I'll have them visit the line's center for a bit to get a couple of cheeky cannon shots in. While they did bring down a few cannons, I really should have had Team Eastern Midrange turn around at this point. If it was just the enemy cannons, I could sweep them off the field, then extricate them to the west where my sniper teams are. But that lone enemy infantry is a problem, one that I didn't properly appreciate in time. Right around here, I realized the problem my right side mid-range team had. I decide to move them to the trees north to give them some cover and some rest for their quickly depleting stamina. And thankfully the situation at the main fight has stabilized enough by now that I was able to micro this area of the map. Oh, hello there, enemy general. Calculated risk time. With 10 minutes before the phase change and at 30% stamina, I decide to try and return the mid-range team to the main line via the direct approach south rather than the safer route west. 
Reason being, given their stamina, if they head west, they'll be taking themselves out of the main combat for most of phase two, while they reposition, rest, and reposition again. And that enemy infantry is still here. This is gonna be real tight. Federals attack Sunken Road. The Federals... send? Another attacking wave. We are greatly outnumbered. General, Dunker Church must be held or else our left flank will certainly collapse. This Sunken Road creates a dominant defensive position that can anchor our right flank. We must defend it. Be careful to guard this bridge because the enemy may attempt to cross it. It is advised to deploy some artillery to target the far shore of the river. I mean, we will be deploying artillery, but that little yellow line stops me from hitting anyone past the bridge. With the map extended, I'll spread out my right side infantry a bit. And then I'll move some brigades around. That enemy holding up my mid-range team is panic retreating. I now have a clear route back to my line, at least. And here comes the reason I wanted that mid-range squad back. Even with good training and better guns, this amount of enemy troops will be able to overrun them even from the defensive cover of the woods. Yikes. If you are all wondering why I haven't given my Phase 2 overview yet, it's because I completely forgot to get a zoomed out view to be able to pause and draw on. Oops. Now that I'm remembered, let's actually explain what's going on here. The battlefield expands east and south, our second core is now in play, and we can now see the edge Antietam Creek. Two large groups of Union reinforcements will arrive this phase, and one of those groups will start flowing in from the bridge here at 838. There will also be two sizable cavalry brigades magically spawning here and here at the times indicated. And we are going to drop an ambush on them the likes of which make previous videos seem quite tame. From 2nd Corps, I will be sending three scrub teams to these three spots. The best defensive cover here is in the house, 
So try to make it so that the brigade that is in the middle is the closest to the actual arrival point and therefore takes the incoming fire. Behind those three infantry will be every single short range and mid range cannon 2nd Corps has. And really, I should have dropped the lone long range equipped battery here too, though in this video I sent it north instead. The 2nd Corps general and a supply wagon will also be stationed here. And everyone here will see a lot of action, so if you have any specific 2nd Corps infantry brigade that you want to get a lot of fire training on, this is the place for it. To deal with the cavalry, I'll have a mid-range team stationed here, and a sniper infantry here, although my positioning on the northern group could have been a bit better. Ideally, the opening volley from these infantry brigades will cause the incoming cavalry brigades to panic and rush along the map edge, where it can be cornered and eliminated before it causes any problems. Of course, if you'd like to see what happens if the cavalry manage to break into the main map, feel free to keep watching. Have I mentioned I'm not really good at split attention micromanagement? The rest of 2nd Corps Infantry will... Proceed north to back up the right side of 1st Corps' line, as well as putting a substantial presence in the woods here. 2nd Corps' sniper team will be around this area, where they can provide sniper fire against approaching northern foes, as well as be a backup in case some depleted cavalry get through. Cough cough. Along with the reinforcements farther south, the Union will get a significant amount of reinforcements from the northeast. One division right at the phase start, another division at 843, another division at 848, and yet another division at 855. This is the reason I don't want my forces in this forest. I've had the opportunity to, rather than retreat the mid-range squad, instead move up two or three infantry brigades to join them in those woods and use it as a holding point. But with a good chunk of my force still dealing with enemies just southwest of it, and the sheer number of reinforcements that will be walking in, this area is just too small to form a full defense. Instead, we want all the Union to move towards us and occupy this large area of open ground. Once they are all in place and engaged, that is when we start sliding troops around for the finishing blows. Which doesn't mean all my guys will be sitting motionless. I'll still try and engage who I can with snipers and flanking teams when possible, just that I don't want to actually reduce the size of this area until I'm ready to do so on all sides. Oh, and speaking of surrounding, I really do need to get those mid-range cannons to the east now. Completely forgot about them. Oops. Anyway, filter a whole enemy core into one open area. Sounds simple, and really it is, but simple doesn't mean easy, and it doesn't mean cheap. I'll be sure to give a nice look at the endgame screen to show just how not cheap it is, don't worry.
as much as I want to finish off those cannons hiding in the northern woods, Hexamer is just completely exhausted. I need to give him a rest. Time to slide the MIT Brigade back. The scrubs currently there are taking a real pounding.
Well, the enemy cavalry got by me. Now I get to chase them around for a while with my mid-range and sniper infantry, I guess. The good news is, it takes a game hour to fully flip an objective point. Those cavalry aren't going to have enough time to take them before I get them back. should have had these guys up farther. Now the Union are getting some wooded cover, and that's not ideal. I think this is the first time all campaign that Union Cavalry managed to do something useful. Good thing there's only two of them. Even when the entire unit trying to cross this bridge is dealt with, don't move your forces away.
Well, Alfred, the Sylvestrian battery actually got shot at, and by a rear flanking no less, and they suffered zero casualties. I take it you installed that Mark III plasteel steel armor on the cannons? I got them all nice and tightly packed here, but half of them are in the woods. That's no good. And those depleted but still present infantry off to the northeast are kind of making it a bad preposition to swing my northern end around too. Like I said, the plan is simple, but it ain't easy or cheap. And do I need to get the melee and training unit out? They have taken way too much of a battering.
Burnside attempts to cross the bridge. The Bluecoats launch their last attempt to break us. They seem to mobilize their forces to pass this stone bridge. It is time to give them a fight here. Watch out for more Union infantry that can cross the river. The city of Sharpsburg must be defended general at all costs. We must push back the Yankees north of Dunker Church. And finally, the Sunken Road area. Clearing this perimeter around the city will secure our victory. Third Corps is now in play. One brigade is already stationed in a defensive spot here, another is in a defensive spot to the south, and everyone else starts back here. Get absolutely everyone, give them sprint orders, and have them charge to where the northern guards are set. This area is about to get nuts. Once the bridge is saved, go ahead and have them just engage in standoff combat for a while. Our side is mostly trees, theirs is mostly open, so it should favor us. And we have a ton of cannons that will arrive over time as well. Oh hey, found what's left of that renegade cavalry from earlier, and I have a sniper group in position to do something about it, no less. Once the cavalry is dealt with, I'll put 3rd Corps snipers in the trees here for spotting and attacks of opportunity. The 2nd Corps bridge is facing another division in change. Give your cannons orders to target their artillery. If they want to get to you, they have to cross the bridge, but that is well covered by your own infantry. You silence their cannons, and this group here is basically doing nothing until the end of the stage when I finally get a chance to deal with them. Other than what has just spawned in, there are no more Union reinforcements. Good news for all your forces up north, there are no more troops coming for them up there. So they just need to pick the right time and go for their own surround. Oh good, my sniper skirmishers have engaged the enemy cavalry in a melee duel. And are apparently winning? Never mind, false alarm, carry on.
random supply wagon, huh? Sure, why not? Okay, let's do a final repositioning here.
took a while, and I needed help from some 3rd Corps infantry getting the other side, but the Snipesimers have finally managed to clear out this entire wooded area of combatants. Now they, and this skirmish detachment, can get all the juicy supply wagons they left for us. Hey, 4th Corps is here, and they are actually going to get to take part in all of this. Time for some horse dudes to see some action. So, once 4th Corps is on field, send them over to where that lone brigade from 3rd Corps is guarding the Southern River Ford. They are going to make a sweep from southwards once it's time to finish this entire Union Army off, so getting them in position, and perhaps with some time to rest, is the plan. There's not a lot of maneuvering for a while, so let me bust out the fast forward tool for a bit.
northern force is done. I'm going to swing a unit to the ford with the skirmish detachment for later. The cannons will head to the second core bridge, and everyone else gets to start getting in some cardio training. Back to normal speed as 4th Corps begins its sweep of Burnside's brigade's backside. to get 3rd Corps forces across the bridge to join them. I think the fastest way to do that is this.
know, I would have felt really silly if I forgot to cover this bridge. Mental fatigue is as much a problem for me as any human. At the end of this battle, I wanted to make sure to do as much damage as I could before time ran out, so 4th Corps' push was continuous rather than letting my cannons continue to hammer the targets. What I forgot was that, like most stages, this one doesn't end exactly when the battle timer hits zero. It actually ends at... Uh, I don't actually know. I could have saved myself some end-of-stage casualties here if I had let the cannons do some extra work, though. If anyone knows the full answer to when this stage actually ends, please drop it in the comments, I'll be sure to pin it.
Thus ends Antietam, the entire Union Army, and McClellan's career. While the casualty ratio was heavily in my favor, it doesn't change that I lost over 14,000 men. Still, the Union brought 75,000 men and had 60,000 not make it home. They are going to be a bit hamstrung in the future after this one. Sorting by the loss column, I can see the biggest hit on my side was down in the Southern Insanity. But the second biggest hit was my melee and training brigade. That was not how I wanted this to turn out, as I'm somewhat obligated to replace their losses with veterans. I did mostly a good job with the rest of the setup, with scrub teams taking the majority of the pain, which I can replace with rookies. Effectiveness wise, this demonstrates what a 24 pound howitzer at close range can do. And the snipesmers are doing what they do best, wrecking entire divisions with few casualties. Seven officer casualties, including two fatalities, Colonel Sweeney and General Reed. A shame, but not unexpected. And Johnston has earned his third star finally. As expected, after downing 60,000 men, there's a bit of captured equipment. That's enough 10-pound ordnance for two whole mid-range batteries, and enough 10-pound parrots for a full long-range squad. Over 6,000 Harper's 1855s, and a bunch of captured supply for cash. Robert E. Lee is now a subordinate general to the Mouse Master. This seems appropriate. I mean, in real life, all he managed to do at Antietam was fight to a stalemate and then run away. And speaking of what total victories can do, Remember at the start of this video when I flashed up to remember this number? The Union sent 35,000 new troops, and even with them in play, the Union Army is still down 25,000 from before Antietam. That's going to be a big help come the next few videos. I'll see you then.